Okay, good morning. Good morning. And you are Kenley Money, mm -hmm. and you are I, with? I volunteer with the Raptor Rehab Center of Central Arkansas in El Paso, Arkansas. And we are a bird of prey hospital. And we receive injured birds of prey from all over the state, and we do whatever we can to rehabilitate them and return them to the wild. There are about five raptor rehabilitators in the state. We are one of two that can handle eagles. And we are fully equipped with a 100-foot flight pen to uh, rehab eagles and release them back to the wild. Our success rate is between 50 and 60 percent, and while that may sound dire, it is not really if you think about our patients. They're birds, they're fragile, and, and the, the injuries that they suffer can be horrific, car strikes, gunshots, lead poisoning, and, and all in all, we have a very good success rate. Okay, and the facility is, the, the rehab facility is at El Paso? Yes, yes. It, it, uh, from the outside, it doesn't look like much. Uh, it, we have a 100-foot mew, which looks like a big chicken house, and, and without any, uh, anything in the middle so the birds can fly back and forth as they rehabilitate. And we've just built a brand new mew. We suffered some significant damage in a storm back in the spring, and our small mew was blown down. So through donations, generous donations, we uh, were able to collect the funds to build a new mew that will be uh, available for rehabilitation in the next month. And a mew again is a? Thank you. A mew is a, is a word that means a big facility to hold birds of prey. And it comes from falconry, uh, but rehabilitators use that term as well. It's a large building with, uh, with wire sides for a good airflow where the birds are perched or housed depending on the injury or their use. Okay. Not an acronym as far as you know for anything? No, it's, it is not an acronym. It is an old English word. It's well, falconry's been around for 3,000 years, and this word's probably been around for 1,000 of that. Kenley's a longtime Ar uh, Arkansas resident. She's originally from Texas. She's been working with the raptors for many years with a special fondness for falcons. She's an educator uh, who's visited many Arkansas schools with the, with the raptor birds, and uh, she enjoys birding, hiking. She loves to be in Yellowstone Park, and locally she likes to hike in Petagene. Along with the raptors, she has two favorite birds, the Mississippi kite and the sandhill crane. Help me welcome Kenley and her friends. Thank you, thank you. I have to say, I have big shoes to fill if you've been to Rodney's program, so be forgiving and I'll try to entertain you as best that I can. <laughs> and by the way, I want to be you when I grow up. Yes, ma'am. You hike in Utah and you see goldfinches, and that's the ball. <laughs> see what I mean? Well, okay, so my name is Kenley Money, and thank you so much for the great introduction. I've been handling birds of prey, gosh, when I was, for 20 years now. I started at the Little Rock Zoo and worked there as a volunteer for about 15. That's where I cut my teeth and I handled everything from the big bald eagle to the African pygmy falcon. And between the two, the pygmy falcon could bring me to my knees when she bit me and the bald eagle couldn't. And it's, I guess it's size and attitude that matters and they know just where to bite you in the cuticle. Oh my goodness gracious. Anyway, at the zoo, I, I uh, specialized in birds of prey, but I was a generalist, and then I, about five years ago, my husband and I, uh, are, who both handled birds of prey, we decided to focus entirely on raptors, and we uh, focused, we went to the Raptor Rehab Center. We'd known Rodney for many years, um, and it was about that time we began our journey to become falconers. And we've been through our apprenticeship and now our general falconers, and come November we'll trap, and, but we'll talk about all that as we go. So my program, I like to ask questions. Feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. The birds have had a thousand pictures taken, so if you want to take a picture while I, they're on my arm, no problem. I probably won't stop. We, want, we have five birds and lots of things to talk about. And after, if there's time, we can do photo ops. They're good with that. They like to have their picture in the paper. <laughs> not, not with me. Um, um, so, uh, but I say, I do ask questions, and sometimes they're strange, and sometimes they're not. And I appreciated the report about the, bird, the sightings, 
and uh, the buffalo gnats, because if, if you followed raptor rehab and if you followed the caracara that was in, you remember, did you see that in the news where a caracara was found in northeast Arkansas and it came to Rodney's facility for rehab and uh, it had, um, who knows why it was up north, the ornithologists say that for some reason caracaras are coming further north, global warming perhaps, I don't know, but it was terribly bothered with buffalo gnats. And do you want to know what it's like to try to rub salve on a wild caracara with a beak this big? <laughs> it's not pleasant. I didn't do it, Rodney did it. Anyway. All right, well, it's not about me. Let's meet our first bird, how about that? <clears throat> Throughout the program, I'm gonna to try to remember to throw out a couple of questions about falconry terms, because falconry, uh, regardless of your stance on hunting, falconry is part of our lives, it's part of our history. It's been around for 3,000 years, 4,000, and, the, and the, the animal management developed in falconry is what we use at the rehabilitation center. And there are things in our language that we use every day that have to do with falconry. And I'll just, let me start with, how, how many of you are boozers? Boozers. No, none of you are boozers. <laughs> But a boozer, when we hear the term boozer, we think of a drunk, right? You know, in the alley, in the, in the ditch. Well, boozer, that or bowser, comes from falconry because peregrine falcons love to take baths. And they'll get in the water and they try <laughs> And, and um, so the falconers of old, 1,500 years ago, called that bowsing. And it sort of translated to boozing and a boozer is someone who's soppy, you know. Okay, we're going to do that throughout. Throughout. I told someone earlier that in all my years of, uh, start here, of doing these programs, of, uh, my birds have only pooped on one kid's head. <laughs> so, you're all right. She does not want to. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, we'll just start. All the birds that I have today uh, have been in Arkansas. Have been Arkansas residents at some point in their evolution. Um, and this is the quintessential bird of prey in Arkansas. It's a silly, if, if, if I were doing programs for kids, I'd say, what is it? It is a red-tailed hawk, so named because of their marvelous rufous or red tail. This is Hope, and you like my stick? Yeah. This is Hope, the red-tailed hawk, and she comes from the center. She was hit by a car, and she has, she, she, she can fly, but really we think there's something wrong with her eyesight, so much so that um, after she was healed, um, uh, she was in an outside pen. It was a, a single bird cage that was um, about this high. And Rodney went to work one day and had forgotten to lock the door, latch it all the way, and the wind blew it open. And there she sat when he got home, the wind wide open. That's because she just couldn't see well enough to go. With a bird of prey, their job in life is to hunt, of course. And their eyesight is the most important thing. And you'll notice these crates here. These crates are solid, and that's to keep it dark. And when they are dark, when they are in the dark, they are calm. Falconers use the hoods they put on the bird's head to keep the birds calm. Another falconry term, hoodwinked. If you're hoodwinked, you're a tricked, right? And that's because the falconers use the hoods on the birds' faces to trick them to be calm. So Hope, she, I can tell you that in the five years, four years I've handled her, she has never missed a meal. So what do you think, how much do you think she weighs? I heard it. She, she weighs uh, probably three and a half to four pounds. Um, um, <clears throat> to train to be a handler, I had, uh, I carry a gallon of milk. A gallon of milk weighs eight pounds. And if you have something like that at the end of your arm, you're going to get tired really fast. So I have my stick. 
But she weighs about four, three and a half to four pounds, and she, her keel, that, yeah. <laughs> uh, her keel is very plump. That's one of the things that we check when we get a new bird, an injured bird, is to how fat are they. And the keel bone, if you think of your Christmas turkey and the breastbone, right, and the good meat's on either side of the breastbone, it's right here, and the keel and the breastbone's right here, so she's nice and plump. But if they're almost always, they're dehydrated, the birds that we get in, and this is very, very pronounced. So quite often, uh, especially with young birds, they don't know how to hunt very well, they get depleted, they get thin, and they come to us, and we simply feed them and, and hydrate them, and they are releasable. Our center has about a 50 to 60% re uh, release rate. And you may think that, that that's terrible, 50%, oh my gosh, but if you think about these animals, they're birds, they're very fragile, very hollow bones, feathers instead of fur. And the, the injuries we see are horrific. Car strikes, gunshots, lead poisoning. We have yet to release one that survived lead poisoning. So 50% so is pretty good. We, uh, uh, a lot of them we get are babies as well, but we'll talk about that. So I like to use the red tail because it is, um, it's like the perfect, perfect example of a bird of prey. Look at the marvelous feet. That is her knife, that is her weapon. They kill with their feet, as you know. They are called raptors because, well, let me ask you a question. How many of you have seen the movie Jurassic Park? You can say it, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> That's important. There is a big bad dinosaur in that movie. What's it called? Velociraptor. The kids always say T-Rex, no. The Velociraptor. Velosa, the word raptor is Latin, it means to seize and not let go. Velociraptor in that movie was called such because its attention seized its prey and didn't let go. It bit and it didn't let go. Well, these are raptors because they catch their prey with their feet and they don't let go. They don't have muscles in their feet. They have tendons that lock. So he'll, Hope would be in the wild and she'd see a rabbit swoop down and grab the rabbit and lock with her talons. That way she expends no energy holding and killing her prey so that she can fly up to the nest or fly wherever and have a tasty meal. Now this is great, but it's problematic because if you are a young osprey or a young eagle that lives on the coast and you see a big 25 pound grouper, uh, they, fishermen have pulled up big fish with dead ospreys and eagles attached to them because they can't, they have to think to let go. So survival of the fittest perhaps, but it, uh, every evolutionary advance has a bit of a downfall. But a great thing. Now, um, well, okay, so I, called, I talked about how much she weighed because there's this sort of generalist, math problem that I give kids, and I'll give it to you, and you guys see if you can get it. Uh, a bird of prey, typically, not accounting for adrenaline, can catch and carry to its nest about a third of its body weight. So if she weighs three pounds, how much can she catch and carry? One pound. Kids love that question. Sometimes they'll say, ten pounds. No. Uh, now, again, that doesn't account for adrenaline because if the bird is in hot pursuit and there's another bird, because they compete all the time for food, they'll, they'll by golly, get a big rabbit up a tree. <laughs> they will, absolutely. But to do it effectively and efficiently, they, weigh, they carry about one, one third of their body weight. So the tails of red-tailed hawks carrying away your chihuahuas or your children are a little exaggerated. A little bit exaggerated. So. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, uh, all right, so <clears throat> Hope is somewhere older than five years old. Here's how I know. A red-tailed hawk gets its red tail in its second year. We get red-tailed hawks all the time that are first-year birds, and they have a stripe, gray striped tail. You guys know. But they ha she has a beautiful brown eye. And when they're young, from zero to five, give or take, their eyes are golden. And they turn brown when they're five-ish. And it's a marvelous transition. It goes from the bottom to the top. 
and it's sorry, dear. Uh, so it starts brown at the bottom, and then as she gets older, by the, it goes to the top. And when she's five-ish, they'll be dark. And so an old red tail has, of course, a red tail and very, very dark eyes. She had golden eyes when we got her at the center. So, <clears throat> all right, Hope, let us put you back. I'm sure I have many more things to say, but we can get her out later if there's time. This is Hope, the red-tailed hawk. All right. Ooh. How long do they live? Great question. Thank you for asking. So, the life of a I'll stay on the paper. The life of a bird of prey is a very tough life. Somewhere around 98% of them don't make it through their first year. And uh, but if they do make it, they tend to be okay. That means they've gained enough hunting skills to do it. Now I've read that the oldest banded red tail that was found was 19, a wild red tail. Uh, that's been some years. That may have been surpassed at this point in time. It was, and in captivity, she could live to be 25. She fed every day, vet care, that sort of thing. Okay. Of the what, man? Oh, the fluffy feathers? Well, um, let me come back. This is a great question. <coughs> See if I can answer it. Hang on. So she has different types of feathers, and these fluffy feathers are, are, are insulation. <laughs> uh, and to fill out, if her wings were extended, they would also, oh, let me see, which one are we talking about? They're for insulation. And I don't know that she's changing her feathers because we're going into fall, <coughs> but it helps with aerodynamics. I, uh, okay. You ready? All right, there we go. Oh my gosh. So I talked about her having a striped tail when she was up to two years old. What a good girl step. Okay, there we go. Um, so a, a first year bird, one that was hatched and migrates uh, in the fall, and red tailed hawks do migrate, uh, that's called a passage bird. Here comes another one of those falconry terms. A second year bird, an older bird, is called a hag or a haggard. So we old hags get our name from falconry. So my next bird here, you will think this is not an Arkansas resident. Your tail is dirty. Yes, I have, I have crate, crate tail. <laughs> you will think, I've never seen this on a bird watch in Arkansas. And thankfully, this bird doesn't weigh nearly as much as hope. I would like for you to meet Arizona, the Harris Hawk. He is so, a Harris Hawk is so named because Mr. Harris was a good friend of James Audubon. So if you're a good friend with James Audubon, you're going to have a bird named after you. All right. So the Harris hawk right now, well, in the past 200 years, is native to the desert southwest, northern Mex well, Mexico, sometimes the north of South America, uh, Utah, Nevada, Arizona. Have you, did you see one out there in Utah? No. <laughs> okay, well, you can look next time. Magpies. Magpies. <laughs> uh, these are desert birds, and why do I put them in with Arkansas birds? Because it has been reported uh, that Harris's hawk, Harris hawks were found in Arkansas mm, 1850 and earlier. But they don't do well, or they didn't at the time, with the encroachment of man. And yes, they're desert birds, but it's like in the two, last 200 years they've had to sort of change their attitude, because certainly there's no desert here. Uh, they are found in dry areas with large cactus, and they use the cactus. It's a very important tool in their hunting. Hmm? The, so they can kill the prey if somebody gets near? Correct. So let's talk about that. Woo! This behavior that you see, or you just saw, was is called baiting. 
B-A-T-I-N-G. Another falconry term, we wait with bated breath. Well, if she was baiting, if he was baiting a lot, he'd be going, because <sighs> he's out of shape. And hence, bated breath. Uh, I don't know why the connotation changed over the years, because with bated breath, you're sort of waiting. But anyway. Um, Harris's hawks, desert birds. In the desert, food is hard to find. Their favorite food in all the world is a jackrabbit. A jackrabbit is far larger than the cottontail that we have here in Arkansas. True? 10 pounds, give or take? We just heard, learned with the hope that a red-tailed hawk or a bird of prey can catch and carry about a third of its body weight. Well, a third of 10 pounds is 3 pounds. This bird weighs 2 pounds. That's not the math that you would compute. So Harris's hawks, Harris hawks, excuse me, have developed a behavior where they hunt cooperatively, just like wolves and lions. No other bird of prey does that. Occasionally you'll see a male and female red-tailed hawk or bearded falcon maybe hunting for their food for their, their babies or exchanging food in air. But these guys hunt and pursue prey. If they, are on, if they see a jackrabbit, they live in family packs, family groups of, I don't know, four to seven to eight birds. They see a jackrabbit. The first one goes out. First one goes out, chases the jackrabbit. He gets tired. He banks off. The second one starts. He gets tired. He banks off. The third one starts. No, the jackrabbit's not getting a break, but the birds are. And finally, the jackrabbit finds a slow cactus, scurries up underneath, and the birds will land and circle the cactus. And then one will go in and they all share and have a tasty meal. Very, very important behavioral characteristic when you live in an area where there's little food. Notice the care physical characteristics of Arizona. Very long legs. If you're sitting, if your job in life is to sit on a cactus, very tall cactus, and you don't want the spines to poke your tummy, right? Well, also, when you live in a family group, you have to sit next to each other, and quite often there's only one stem or stalk on that cactus. So if Arizona lands on that cactus, where is his brother going to sit? On one everything. No, well, maybe if there is one, he sits right here. And then another one's here, and another one's here, and another one's here. And they, luckily they have really thick feathers here. They don't hurt each other. That behavior is called stacking. So they're all looking for rabbits. Good thing he's got long legs or Arizona's tummy would be poked by the cactus. They're all looking. That behavior was discovered by Dr. James Bednarz from the Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. Yeah. The Harris's hawk. Well, Arizona was a falconry bird. He's a retired falconry bird. And he's, I don't know, 12, 15 years old and, and for whatever reason didn't want to hunt anymore. Sometimes falconry birds do that. Harris's hawks are very common and they're very popular in falconry because they hunt cooperatively. You can go out with fellow falconers with Harris's hawks and they'll hunt squirrels together. But uh, and he was born in captivity as such, but he had just decided he didn't want to hunt anymore. That's his prerogative. So the falconer gave him to Rodney to become an education bird. He has a band <coughs> on his leg to, that shows that you can trace that. The Harris's hawk, the Harris hawk, excuse me, is the uh, thunderbird from Native American legend. So, uh, not the totem poles in the north, but the thunderbird references in the southwestern United States. So, I find that very, uh, very impressive that you've never seen one. There he is, the thunderbird. Let's go to our next one. How many, the question is how many eggs do they lay? She'll, uh, uh, he'll have two to three, depending. Are you going to really do that? Hang on, step. So we have three of these tall crates, and poor Arizona didn't get one, so he's like, you want me to go away? Okay. These big tall, uh, three eggs, typically, it depends on the birds. Some birds have more, some have less. Uh, and then you were talking about the, um, the eggs that disappeared from the nest boxes, the whatever. Mm -hmm. 
It is entirely possible that the eggs were dead and the birds got rid of them themselves. Now it wasn't a snake. It could have been a snake. But uh, thank you very much. All right. So I need my, I'm going to need my stick for this one. We've been talking about diurnal birds. Let's talk about something else. Step. Step. Triangulate 
because they marked their territory vocally. And I could hear one here, and I could hear one down there. And Maumelle has a lot of woods, not as much as here, but it's pretty wooded. And I am not exaggerating when I say that my, one of my terriers stopped and looked at me and said, Mama, that ain't right. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's an owl. And he's done it twice in the 10 years I've lived there with, uh, in response to owls. Of course, they're not going to swoop down and get your dog. But it was fu funny that that noise triggered that reaction in a dog. The, uh, as, <clears throat> I'll ask quite, I ask quite often if owls can turn their heads all the way around. So I will ask you, can owls turn their heads all the way around? Yes, that's a bad thing though. They cannot. They can go 270 degrees so it looks like it. But it's not really, so, okay. <laughs> so, but it's all the way this way and all the way that way. And they do it for a very important reason. But let me ask a question first. How many neck bones do you think he has? He has how many? Zero. <laughs> well, that is an odd, that's an, how many neck bones do we have? We have seven. How many neck bones does a giraffe have? Seven. Seven. They're really big. An owl has 14 neck bones. Owls have no muscles in their eyes. When your job in life is to fly and hunt, you want to be as lightweight as possible. Hollow bones, feathers instead of fur. Re a reduction in, uh, when female birds have a single ovary. A reduction in muscular, unnecessary musculature is important. So owls have evolved to have more neck bones. A neck bone is lighter than muscles. And they, their eyes are stationary in their skull. So that means that they can't move their eyes back and forth like we can, and they have to use the flexibility of their neck to see from side to side. 14 neck bones weigh less than the musculature required to move your eye. Do owls have ears? Yes, but it's not this. <laughs> it's not that. Okay. Those are ear tufts, and their only function in life on a great horned owl is for beauty. <laughs> their ears are openings in the sides of their faces, and they're asymmetrical, one's a little higher than the other. Each are controlled by a muscle flap that can control where, kind of where the ear, where do the sound is coming from, and also protect it from water. And they use, you see the black crescents on either side of uh, Bogart's face there? Those are very special feathers. And they are not wing feathers or tail feathers or downy feathers or contour feathers. They're thick and compact feathers, kind of like a really thick toothbrush. And they serve as a satellite dish, kind of. A dish, and it collects the sound. The sound comes from all over and can... I really would like to point that out, but you're going to bite me. But it hits the disc there where those feathers are and is directed to their ears. Another weight-saving measure, they don't need these things like we have that stick out. Our job is not to fly and be aerodynamic. <laughs> what do you think, Bogart? Bogart, owls have, um, all right, here's my question because I was about to go to paragraph two. Uh, what is... Diurnal means to hunt at night, uh, day, excuse me. Nocturnal means to hunt at night, but great horned owls are different. They are crepuscular. A, a creature with or an owl, we'll talk with owls, yellow eyes are crepuscular. That means they are, they're better suited to hunt in the morning and in the evening. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, not Mississippi kites. Uh, a, is it a nighthawk or a nightingale? Nighthawk. Anyway, they have red eyes because they are crepuscular. And do, Mississippi kites do like to hunt in the evening when the bugs are up. So I didn't bring a dark-eyed owl like a barred owl or a barn owl, but they have black eyes. And they are better suited to hunt in the darkest part of the night. Make no mistake, an owl will hunt any time food runs across its path but they are better suited for those times of day. Uh, <coughs> in an owl's eyes, thank you. In an owl's eyes, well, all eyes, we have rods and cones. Cones see color, rods see shape. 
We have 200,000, give or take, rods in our eyes. Well, um, and more, and I don't know the relation, but we see color, obviously. Uh, owls have millions of rods in their eyes and far fewer cones. They sacrifice color for shape to see in the night. A hawk or an eagle, it's the other way. They do see some color, but they have millions and millions of more rods than uh, uh, cones. Thank you. <laughs> I was getting there uh, to be able to see during the daytime. So, yes, all right. But the ratio is about the same in a dark-eyed owl, but they are more finely uh, attuned for shape. Okay, let's see another owl. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what? They look so intimidating to us. I wonder if they use that as for the brain. No. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. No, they are all about stealth. They are all about stealth. An owl has special filaments on its feathers to create silent flight. Now, if you've heard uh, Bogart flap, it's A, because of the microphone, or B, because its feathers are hitting my glove, or something like that. But when they're in the glide, and they, and they know where their prey is, you cannot hear them. You cannot hear them fly because of the, the special filaments on their feathers. I'm going to get an owl that's not as loud. Step. Step. Uh-huh. OK. Lord have mercy. Okay. All right. Come on. Get in there. Thank you. That was graceful. Here. After. Here's a, an owl feather. We can look at that. Yeah. See the filaments on it. All right. Okay. You know, just because he's small doesn't mean that he's easy. All right. Oh, all right. Step. No, ouch. You talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Yep. Gotta get up there. Thank you for uh, only having one chest. What you do with the other one? guys have sort of a greenish yellow sear. The sear is the part of the top of the beak where the nostrils are. And in our, and for eastern screech owls, there are two color variations, gray and red. And obviously we have a gray one. 
the red, uh, this one's sibling, the, uh, the tree fell down in a storm and the, so the screech owls were rescued. And you can have red and gray in the same clutch and the red brother is in the, in the Little Rock Zoo's education program. <clears throat> so we've had Gizmo now about five years, uh, maybe four. And isn't he just, besides being scruffy, isn't he just the cutest thing? <laughs> He's a good thing. These are the toughest owls. They are very territorial. If you're ever on an owl prowl and you do an owl, a screech owl call, you'll call them in. And they're not there. They're not coming to say, oh, who are you? They're coming to say, why are you in my territory and I want you out now? That's what it's all about in screech owls. Territory. Territory is very, very important. You'll notice that this bird has many of the same characteristics as the gray horned owl. I, would, I don't know that you can see the feather tufts because we're in the molt. <laughs> Um, but he's got feather tufts. Now, the, the, the use of a feather tuft in a screech owl is different than that in a great horned owl. The great horned owl is for beauty, and while it is very beautiful on a screech owl, it is there for, uh, to fool predators. Uh, we had a gizmo out once, and another hawk came out, and gizmo went, ooh, and he stood on his tiptoes and elongated his body and stuck his feather tufts up as high as he could so he would look much, much bigger than he is because he was threatened by this other bird. He, you can somewhat see the facial disc that I talked about with the compact feathers that aid in his hearing. It's a little more pronounced uh, on the screech owl. The, the black crescent-shaped border is not as, as obvious on the screech owl. Some say that, um, me, some say that screech owl, the gray ones, like to hang out in oak trees, and the red ones like to hang out in pine trees. I have not found that to be true. Um, they hang out in whatever tree they want, but <laughs> some, sometimes. Uh, screech owls, see, this is not, uh, a lot of times the kids will ask me if this is the baby great horned owl, and it is not, of course. It's an entirely different species of owl and, and far more tough, I should say. They like to eat. Um, they like to eat crawdads. They like little lizards and little mice and grasshoppers. This is the time of year in the fields in South Arkansas when the grasshoppers are abundant and they're huge. If you you know they're huge, and this is like a bountiful time for all birds of prey. I we have even seen red-tailed hawks down there just eating the grasshoppers in a in a cornfield that has been harvested because they're easy and they're full of protein. It's not glamorous or romantic prey, but you got to do what you got to do if you're about to migrate. Screech, I don't know what you're seeing up there. Screech owls love insects like that. They carry their food in their mouth. The, the uh, raptors, most raptors, carry their food in their feet to wherever, but screech owls will carry the food in their mouth. What are you looking at, little man? Up there? You know, it's hard to describe the, the color, the colors that they see and the ultraviolet light that they see. And sometimes these lights are bothering him, but they see it differently than we do, absolutely. Owls of all sorts like to swallow their food whole. Unlike a hawk or an eagle, they like to take bites. You saw that big, big sharp beak on Arizona and on Hope. <coughs> the, this guy, he has an enormous mouth. So now I have a question. Who, who's heard the adage that owls are wise? <laughs> wise old owl. There was an old owl that lived in an oak. The more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Oh, that men were like that wise bird. <laughs> it is not true. Owl's heads are full of mouth and eyeball. Their brains are very small. <laughs> so if he would open his mouth, it would be this enormous gaping orifice because he likes to swallow his prey whole. The strangest question I ever had in any program I've ever done, it was in, at uh, Land Between the Lakes in Kentucky, and I had a, bar to, a barn owl, excuse me, and a little boy said, why does he look like a banana? <laughs> I held my comp 
composure and, and provided some answer with few hums and haws. And later that day, his mother came to me and she said, he meant the bird's beak. Well, it made sense then because in the barn owl, they have these long, pale colored beaks because their mouths are so big because they swallow their food whole. And in a barn owl, look, at, look over there. All right. Uh, in a barn owl, you, you can see how long Gizmo's beak is, but in a barn owl, it's a much bigger bird. It's about that long. <laughs> but thank you, barn owl. Yes, ma'am. So this, uh, he swallowed his food whole alive? Yes. Well, I said that yes. No. They would like, they do what they can to kill their prey. I can't speak for grasshoppers. I don't really know how they kill a grasshopper. But uh, dead is better because dead prey doesn't bite. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Why are they the most tough? Why are they tough? Because they're really territorial. And if you, if he thinks that you are in his territory and you're a threat, he's going to go, oh. he's going to come up and But he's so small. I know, he doesn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> he's so small, the young man. He doesn't think so. He does, it's all the attitude. <laughs> so I talk about, do they eat dead prey? And everything, everything is designed to survive some way or another. And in falconry, one of, we have, um, I think some of you know uh, Rusty Scarborough, and he, he's a falconer, a master falconer, has been hunting for decades, and he has liked in the past to hunt squirrels with his Harris's hawk. He has Harris's hawk like, Air, like uh, Arizona. And this past couple of years, he's just had some bad luck because squirrels are the most ferocious creature on the face of the planet, and they object to being hunted by birds of prey. And when they are caught, more often than if, if they're not, a bird of prey likes to catch its prey by its head and use its hallux, which is that back talon, to kill it right away, right here. But if the bird misses, squirrels will come, they'll double up and come up, and they have been known to bite toes off of birds of prey. Our other Harris hawk who didn't come today, Phoenix, she's missing a toe on one of her feet because she was a falconer's bird and a squirrel bit her toe off. So, so I, I say that because sometimes folks will say, well, it's mean, hunting is mean, well, with birds of prey, but it's natural. These birds hunt uh, um, and, and the birds that are caught for falconry would probably have died anyway, 98% chance to die, and they're taught to hunt, but the squirrels and the prey, they have very good self-defense, and the success of rate, uh, the success rate of hunting is really actually pretty small. My, yes, sir? I uh, know the uh, owls, when they eat, swallow a whole mouse, Yes. and they digest it, and mm -hmm. you find it on the ground, you can actually open it up and there's a whole mouse skeleton. Yes, thank you for saying that. He's talking about a pellet. And the first stage in a bird of prey digestive system, owls especially, is their crop, which is right here. It's sort of a pouch thing. And, and after our birds eat, the food is right here, and they've got this big bulge. And the, that, the digestion starts there, and then it moves down to the stomach, and they regurgitate the, the hair and the bones, the undigestible pieces. So if you're in the woods and you're looking for an owl, do not look up. <laughs> look down. And when you see a pellet, then look up and you'll see your owl. Hawks and eagles also regurgitate pellets, but they're not that pretty compact elliptical thing that an owl does. Like it's like a kind of a flat egg looking thing, but it's more of a, it's more stringy. And quite often there are not bones in it, but it's just the fur. So. I guess you're ready to go in. You bit my thumb. So, yeah. All right. Let's meet the last bird. Let's see. I've got to look at my list of things. Uh, so, you know, most of these ter falconry terms have to do with older people. So, have you have you heard the term "you old codger"? Yeah. You heard that? You old codger. Yep. Um, well. In falconry, in the old days, uh, 
four or five hundred years ago. You know, falconry, they call it this, one of the sports of kings, horse racing is the other, I guess. And <clears throat> there was a there was a, a, a hierarchy to who can hunt with what. You know, kings can hunt with eagles and jeer falcons and princes hunted with goshawks and you know, knaves with merlins, etc. And the falconer, uh, and sometimes the king would have a falconer, the falconer who hunted for him. And if falconers got too old, they, they began to carry the birds. And there was this, um, this contraption, it's a, and they use them today over in England still, and it's a, like a, a square made of two by fours with um, carpet or material over it and with a harness that goes over the shoulder, so it's like kind of like a skirt, and the person steps into it, and it holds it like this, so, uh, and the birds sit on it, and they walk, the guy walks through the fields with it, and that guy, that thing is called a codge, and so the old retired falconer who got to carry it is called the codger, <laughs> so. Uh <-huh. laughs> you old codger. All right, so it's time for the, the star of the show. We saved the best for last. Step. Step, step. I would like for you to meet Shaheen, the peregrine falcon. Specifically, it's an anatom falcon. There are all sorts of subspecies of a peregrine falcon. Shaheen came to us. He was uh, uh, migrating south, and he suffered a wing injury. Let's see if you can see it. It's on his right wing. And the tip of this wing has been sheared off. Um, actually, I think it was present, but they had to amputate it. There you go. Uh, hey, that's pretty good. That's five birds in almost an hour. <laughs> so he was found in Searcy, Arkansas, and uh, brought to the center. And our we had a peregrine falcon, Sunder, who may have come here before, and she was probably 25 years old, and she passed. And so Shaheen came just in time to replace her. Shaheen is growing into his mature feathers. An immature peregrine falcon is much more spotted. You see the bottom of his wings and how spotted it is? The immature falcons have those spots almost all over their bodies, and as they mature, they grow to have this beautiful dark coloration. Yes, he says, I've been in that crate too long. He loves to flap. Can he actually fly? He cannot fly. He could flutter and scare me really bad, but he, uh, he cannot fly. Because this wing is, is missing about two inches. <clears throat> the peregrine falcon, the peregrine falcon is, is uh, an ancient symbol that's part of our lives every day. The peregrine falcon is the fastest bird in the world, not, not straight line flight, but in the way it hunts. They are bird hunters. They love to hunt ducks. Sometimes they're called duck hawks. And the way they hunt, is is by stealth and surprise. Um, um, someone, you showed me the, vid the video. There's a video out right now of a peregrine falcon stooping. They go, a peregrine will spot its prey, let's say it's a duck flying, and he'll fly high above the prey, get between the prey and the sun. So when the bird looks up, he just, oh, I don't see anything. And also, he's got this white mottled color, so the prey can't really, the duck can't really tell. And when the time is right, and the peregrine knows it, he'll tuck his wings and turn into a teardrop and fall out of the sky at a height that creates a speed up to 260 miles an hour. And when he hits the bird, he strafes it. And either the impact kills the prey, or his, the, he'll use his talons to strafe it. And, and, and mortally wound the animal. Now, a peregrine falcon's feet are not like Hope's. Hope, the red tail, had those big old strong feet designed to catch a rabbit. Well, this, has, this bird has 
spindly feet, not designed to carry big pieces of prey up to its nest. It is designed to slice and strafe and surprise its prey in that fashion. So if you can, if, 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 is that video on Audubon? Is that video on Audubon? There was a picture on Hot Springs Day. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I think, I think there is a video on Audubon, and do look for it. Uh, <clears throat> so when you came in, I said I have a cockatoo reference. Peregrine falcons are the loudest creatures on the face of the planet, and I compare it to a cockatoo, having worked with cockatoos, which are very loud. <laughs> Uh, in, in the recent Audubon, maybe it, I saw it on the Audubon website, there was a story about a peregrine falcon pair that made a nest on the 27th floor of High Rise in Chicago. And uh, the guy who lived there, it happened a couple of years ago, and the guy who lived there was like, hey, cool, that's really cool, but they are so loud. This one's not. He's, you're being very nice. They are so loud that the neighbors complained and the building management made him, made, uh, shooed them away, not knowing that all birds of prey are protected by the federal government and that is against the law to do. And so the, uh, the local Audubon and bird of prey experts said, well, that's great, but they probably won't come back. Well, they didn't come back. And this guy, who's a bachelor, he had this balcony on the 27th floor and a flower box that was empty. What bachelor do you know that grows flowers, right? And these peregrines went. So they came back and the guy petitioned to the building management and got permission to let the birds stay. So he had enough time, he put all these drop claws on the balcony and the birds hatched four babies. Now in Chicago, what's the plentiful food? Pigeons. <laughs> Marvelous. Well, it turned out to be a block party on the 27th floor of all the surrounding buildings because they, all the tenants would come out and sit on their porches and drink beer and watch the birds. And photographers came from all over the world and it was quite the thing. <laughs> Peregrine falcons, of course, came from the brink of extinction. Our use of DDT just, just devastated the large bird of prey, the large predator population in the United States in the 60s. And somewhere in that time, the falconers, the local falconers, took up a cause to try to save it. And with lots of petitioning, and of course Rachel Carson's book, A Silent Spring, the tide began to turn. And the peregrine falcon population grew. And <clears throat> peregrine means to wander. And only about three or four years ago did the U.S. Fish and Wildlife allow the taking of one peregrine falcon for falconry in Arkansas. Wow. <laughs> and uh, the gentleman who took it, um, um, the one for two years, so the gentleman who took it has it today. And probably, I don't know how long he'll keep it, but he's trained it to hunt. And he'll hunt with it this spring, and he'll release it back to the wild. And just think, a perfectly trained, healthy bird back into the wild to populate, help stimulate the gene pool. So let's talk about Shaheen. He, she, he's like, talk about me. So look at the face. That face, and pair, all falcons have a sideburn. See that dark stripe that goes below his eyes? Well, that is very important. What animal lives in Africa that has black spots under its eyes? A cheetah. Right. What sport do we play where we put black under our eyes? Football. Some baseball. And that's to help deflect the light and keep the glare out of your eyes. It's important for survival. All falcons have it. Think about it. They hunt in the sunlight. And so they have this darkness. They have this darkness shining with them. Okay. Uh, to help them see better. Um, he probably weighs oh, I don't know, about a pound. Not a very big animal whatsoever, but still highly efficient. And you can see, I don't know if you recall, when Hope opened her wings, she has broad wings designed for soaring. You know where you see red-tailed hawks. You're driving down the road in the fall, late fall, winter, to Memphis, to Texarkana, and you'll see a red-tailed hawk on every telephone pole. Well, all those guys, they've migrated in because there's a lot of good food in Arkansas and they're quite often the young ones that come in first, but their job, they soar over the fields to find their food. Well, these guys, of course, fly to catch, they need speed and agility to catch their food. 
<clears throat> and that's why they have long pointy wings, unlike Hope or even Arizona that have broad, flat wings. Can you show it again one more time? <laughs> we have learned, yes ma'am? Then how do they carry it up? Well, they, <laughs> they will, that's going to lead me to my next and last falconry term. So they, they'll catch a big duck, but they have to eat it where they catch it. And if it's a baby, then they'll carry it, but a big old mallard, which they can kill, they'll eat it and they catch it. They, they eat it where they get it down. And they eat fast and, and are always wary. But when a bird of prey takes a, a prey down and they land on it, they're going to mantle it. And that means like this, right? They put their wings over it. Don't steal my prey. You can't see my prey. You can't see my kill. Don't steal my kill. If a bald eagle was around, it would take it in a heartbeat. Oh, look at that peregrine. Nice, tasty duck. I think I'll eat it. Uh, why kill something that something else has killed? Um, but that leads me to my term, mantle. Our mantle is over our fireplace to help control and cover the fireplace opening so that the smoke doesn't escape. That comes from mantle. I don't think I have any more. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the, think of an, an Air Force jet. Think of a commercial airplane that has a cone in its engine and a bunch of blades, right, when they, we moved away from propeller airplanes for commercial flight and military flight. The engine design, that cone design in a military jet comes from the Peregrine Falcon. When you fly 260 miles an hour, you have got to breathe. And if without any special structural help, you're going to suffocate. So if in, uh, autopsies have shown that there's a little bump uh, inside the nostril, which you can see, but that takes, that's a, like a, the end of a channel in their sinuses that winds around and controls the airflow. So when the bird is plummeting from the sky, he does not suffocate. And that concept was used in aeronautic engineering and engine design today, which incidentally is what Rodney Paul works on. So it's an interesting story how it comes around. <laughs> Lots to say about peregrines, but I'll finish with this. In the late 1960s, Apollo 15, the last day the astronauts were on the moon, uh, the commander did an unauthorized experiment. He took a great big hammer, some hammer, and the feather, the wing feather from a peregrine falcon. And he did a test about gravity. Because physics say that if you, when there is no, when there's a vacuum, and you drop two things regardless of their weight, they're going to fall at the same rate of speed. And it did. Why did he choose a peregrine falcon? The, shit, the trip's name was Falcon, had falcon in it. It is part of our lives and always will be the peregrine falcon for the literature and art and language. A marvelous bird, and it's the only interstellar bird that you'll ever meet. <laughs> Interplanetary.